Good morning, guys. Thank you very much for being with us. It's great to have you here again, and it's again great to have Gavin with us for another series of Fix a Photo. Without any further ado, Gavin, before I actually pass over to you, if any of you have images that you want to submit for this, send it through to fixaphoto at theimagefile.com or look at the image file page. If you just do a search for Fix a Photo, you'll get all the details there, and then we can pass them through to Gavin, uh, the ones that we think, yeah, that's the sort of image. So send them through and get them included. Gavin, over to you. Thank you very much, James. Yeah, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome along. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted the image file have invited me back to do a, another series of, of Fix a Photo, because I rather enjoy doing these, so this is, this is good fun. And today we've got a, a bunch of, of your images we're going to fix and adjust and, and generally uh, work through, uh, and this should run for the next sort of 30 minutes or so. Now, I'd like to point out that this is a completely live webinar. Absolutely anything can happen in the next 30 minutes. That's all part of the fun of a live presentation. Uh, and just to reiterate what James said, yeah, if you have some pictures, please send them along. That would be brilliant. And uh, it's always good to have a nice range to choose from. Okay, so without further ado, let's close this down and we'll, we'll get on with the first image of the new series that needs fixing. Uh, we've got a, a few to work through today. And see, we've got a nice little range, everything from, from wildlife to landscape to portraits. So hopefully something for everybody. Now, uh, I should point out that all of these pictures come in anonymously. Uh, we, we never reveal who the photographer is. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, so I don't know who this is, but I, I know what they want. So uh, when you send your images in, it's nice to have a little bit of a background to these and, and where you're trying to go with them. So a uh, photographer in question here writes that if they were lucky enough to get this photograph, and I think they were lucky, that's a good shot. Uh, but they've been told that the owl is a little bit too central, and can it be moved? Ah, that's one of those things of composition, isn't it? I think you are absolutely jolly lucky to get this. It's obviously a, a display owl, but nonetheless, getting the position, uh, these things fly pretty quick, getting it in focus, you've done a fantastic job. And then someone says, yeah, you've got to move it. Okay, well, that's fine. We, we can move it if that's what you want to do. How are we going to move it? Well, what I love about Photoshop is the, the variety and the ways that in which you can actually achieve the end result in, in more than one different direction. There's, there's no rights and there's no wrongs. So I'm going to show you not one, not two, but three different ways that this can be achieved because they will all work in different circumstances and, uh, yeah, and depending on how you want to work with Photoshop, they are all correct. So let's start with the, the most basic, straightforward, old school method of doing things and that is just to jump to the, the toolbar on the side and grab the clone stamp tool. Now the clone stamp tool is, well it, it was literally been around since the beginning of Photoshop and it's a remarkably useful tool. The way it works is I just sample part of the picture by holding the Alt key or the Option key on a Mac and I just click uh, anywhere, I'm going to choose the, the owl's face as my sample point. When I come over to the side you can see my little brush has an owl's eye in the middle of it. Now, that's really great because it shows me where things are going to go. And all I need to do to move this is simply click and don't let go of the mouse. Okay, as long as I don't let go of the mouse, I'll be absolutely fine. I've maybe just gone a little bit too far to the side, but we'll get the idea. I can come down here and I can paint in the side and, and so on. Now, you're probably thinking that's great, but now we've got two overlapping owls um, with three, three wings. <laughs> so let's just keep going. Again, I'm not letting go of the mouse. I'm just going to keep going. And I can just clone this away, clone it away, and keep going like that. And the hours move. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of a, an edge there. So I could choose another sample point from the side and paint over that like that. And within seconds, I've moved the owl. OK, I've done it too far, I'll admit. But hey, didn't I say this was live? I <laughs> just want to prove it was. But you can see that this is absolutely seamless. I, I just cannot see the join that I've done there. And that works in this case because of the background. The background has got this beautiful even illumination. The brightness on the right side is the same as the brightness on the left side. There's no difference between them. It's just one of those days and one of those shots where that is the case. And that's what made it possible. If there was a difference in, in tone across the picture, this wouldn't have worked anywhere near as convincingly. So that works in this case very well indeed. Let's undo it. We'll go back to where we started. So how else could you do this? Well, maybe you don't want to go old school. Maybe you're the kind of photographer that likes to embrace the new. 
Show me what's new, Gavin. Show me, show me some new technology. It's got to be a more up-to-date way of doing this. I could do that since leading a Photoshop. Uh, well, yep, there is indeed. There's always a new way of doing anything in Photoshop, and it's good to keep abreast of what's changing. So I'm going to come over to the Spot Healing Brush here. If I click and hold on it and come down, I'll find something called the Content Aware Move Tool. Now, the Content Aware Move Tool is a relatively new tool. It's been around since Photoshop CS6. So CS6, uh, CC, CC2014. And although I haven't checked it out, I was reading the, the press release this morning for Photoshop Elements 13, and I think it's in there now too. So um, this is a tool that is, is, is coming of age. Now this tool works really simply. It really is um, very straightforward to use. You really only have one thing to set, and that is the mode. The mode you can move or extend. Now we want to move the owl, so obviously I want to use the move mode. But if I wanted to extend something, say for example we wanted to make a tree taller, or a fence longer, or, or whatever, then that would be the extend mode. So I'm going to switch into the move mode, and that's hard to say in the morning, the mood mode. I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to draw around the owl. That's all I have to do, just really badly draw around the thing I want to move. Round and round we go, and back to the beginning. So I draw one of the least accurate selections you'll ever see, but in this case, that's what you want. You want a really loose selection, as it's called, or a really bad selection, as I would call it. And that's perfect, because now I just click in the middle of that selection, and I drag my owl over to the side, and we can come all the way across like that, and it moves him. But pretty obviously, it's still left behind the original owl. Well, when I let go of the mouse, I get this little kind of thinking circle, and it will need a bit of thinking. It'll do two things. It'll move and blend in the edges of that loose selection, but then it'll go back to the original selection point and fill in the hole that it leaves behind. Ta-da! There you go. So that moves the owl, in this case, across using the, the content aware move tool. It really is as simple as drawing a selection and dragging something. Once again, it works really well on this type of background, uh, but it will work also very well if the, the background is um, a little more textured or a little bit more graded in tone. The only problem, of course, and I'm sure you're all shouting at your screens, is what about the reflection or the shadow in this case? Because it's obviously a very strong daylight shot, this, but judging by the scene, that shadow would need to be moved as well. Or would it? I suppose we wouldn't have to. We could pretend the sun was coming from this angle. Who's to say what is right and wrong? None of us were there apart from the photographer. So, you know, I would want to move the shadow, but you wouldn't want to necessarily. That, that's all well and good, but there's one more way I'm going to do it. And the way I actually want to do this, if I go back to the beginning, is the way that is least destructive. Because both the cloning method and the content aware move method involved rebuilding the picture, changing the pixels around and making a significant difference to the image. So my third way is the way that is least destructive because it keeps the, the original integrity of the shot. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get the layers and I'm going to get rid of this padlock. Now, this is a lovely, a lovely new little feature of CS, whatever you are now, Photoshop CC rather. All I need to do to remove the padlock is I click it once, and it's gone. I love that. That's such a nice little touch. If you have an older version of Photoshop, all you do is you click and you drag the padlock, and you drop it at the bin at the bottom of the screen. Technically, that's only one more click, but I'm guessing all those clicks add up over the years, and, and my fingers have got to last me a lifetime, so uh, I'm counting those clicks, and <laughs> that's one saved. Thank you, Adobe. So I've got rid of the, the background layer. I need a, a copy of that layer. So I'm just going to drag it down, down, all the way down to the new layer icon, which is right at the bottom of the screen, and let go. And when I do, and I managed to click three buttons at once there, that was kind of clever, get rid of that. Uh, when I do, I'll get an exact copy of the image. Okay, so we have an exact layer, an exact copy. So what I'm going to do now is just to get the, the move tool, just the ordinary move tool, and I'm just going to drag our little owl over to the side, something like that. Now that works quite well, except there's a clear and obvious line down the, the edge here. Well, that's where that bottom layer is going to come in. So I'll click on the bottom layer to make it active, and just drag it across. Now I'm holding the Shift key as I drag to make sure everything stays nice and straight. And we'll keep going until the edge of the wing disappears. There we go. So what I've done is I now have the, the right side of the image over on the left. 
and the middle of the image over on the right. All I need to do is to click on the top layer, put a layer mask on there, and just grab the, the paintbrush, or I could have used the eraser tool, I suppose, but you know, we'll keep it nice and, and, and neat and tidy, and we'll just erase or mask that through as neat as I can. There we go, that looks pretty good, and you literally wouldn't be able to tell there was a join there at all. Perfect. So I haven't moved any pixels around, I've just moved the picture from side to side and kept the integrity of the shot. And I can see where the other photographers were going. Yes, that does give the owl some room to fly into. And uh, yeah, I think, hopefully, convincingly answers the photographer's question. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the, the next shot and do something oh completely different. So uh, we've got a portrait, so let's do a portrait. And uh, again, this comes with a message, and the message uh, is it's really short. I like short messages. This is good. It, is it possible to recover detail from the white in the guitar? Um, very short message. Uh, kind of a short answer as well, because um, the, the short answer is, well, not really, no. There's a, there's a longer answer that you're going to like rather than that shorter answer. But let me explain what the, the problem is here. So the photographer has done a really good job. Let me give full credit to the photographer here. Shooting white background in a studio sounds so easy, but in reality is a really tricky thing to do. Um, and you know a photographer's done well when you look at the, the hairline and it, it, it looks kind of good. I don't think they've done any cutting out. If they have, they've done a really good job at cutting out and I'll give me more credit. But what's happened is your, your model has turned up not dressed in white, which is one of my requirements. I always say, um, oops, there we go. Can you see my screen now? That would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> we can indeed, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, not dressed in white, and uh, I'll zoom back out for those that couldn't see it before, which was everybody. There we go. And they, they've got this white guitar out of their case, and you're probably sat there thinking, blimey, I've, I've now got to light a white guitar separately. And it is a challenge to do that. It really is quite difficult to do. I think what's happened is the, the photographer has um, just got the light bouncing off the guitar back at the camera. Maybe just angling the, the guitar would have helped, but there you go. That's one of those things. So what can we do? Because we obviously can't have an invisible guitar. We need to do something here to fix it. This is, might have been a commercial shoot. This could be really important. So rather than trying to recover it, we're going to end up having to, to fake it, to, to um, rebuild the guitar. I can show you what we could have done. If we had a RAW file, I can jump this image into Adobe Camera RAW. And if I zoom in a little bit, if we had the raw file, we could have pulled back the highlights and maybe got something out of it, but with the JPEG, there's just no detail in the highlights to recover, which is such a shame. So instead, I'm going to build the guitar from scratch by starting with a brand new empty layer. So blank layer, nothing on it whatsoever. Okay, so we have a blank empty layer. And then what I'm going to do next is to start painting with a paintbrush. Now the color I want to paint in is white because it's a white guitar. But here's the thing about whites. White is never really white. It's just a shade of gray. Things that we think of white are often just a very, very light gray. So that's what I'm going to paint in. Uh, I'm going to change my foreground color by clicking on it. And I'm going to change the brightness to 95%. So I don't know if you can see, but there's a very small circle here. That, that is the, my, my sample point, and it's very nearly at the white point, but it's just slightly off-white. And that's what we want. We want a white that's not really white. Now, where am I going to paint? Well, we've got a few visual clues. I honestly know absolutely nothing about guitars, so I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to name the parts. But I'm guessing that it should have curved around, and there is something here that looks like that's where the strap might have attached. Don't quote me on that. And there might be a bit under his arm there. I can't quite tell. But I'm guessing it should be a, a nice curvy one rather than one of those kind of um, sort of you know, heavy metal, weird shaped ones. So let me get the, the paintbrush tool. And we'll get a nice big brush that's about that same curvature. And I'm also going to change my hardness so it's a nice hard edged brush as well. Okay, and I'm going to roughly fit it in. I'm not going to be exact about it because uh, you, you can be exact later on, but for the purpose of the demonstration, I'm going to click once 
like so, and that's where I think the back of the guitar should go. Well, I think that answers the, uh, the question quite comprehensively. I'm joking, of course. That, that's, that's not going to convince anybody that that's, that's just covering up the problem. What we now need to do is to blend that in with the picture below. And whenever you think about blending two layers together, you're always going to think about layer blending modes. So the layer blending mode I'm going to use is going to be multiply. And that will take these slightly darker pixels and blend them in with these slightly lighter pixels, but still allow me to see through what's going on. So you can kind of hint that, yeah, maybe there is a guitar there that kind of looks good, but there's still this rest, this circle we need to deal with. So for that, we just put a layer mask on the layer. There it is, just one little white rectangle right there. And I get a paintbrush, and I'm making sure I'm painting with black. I'm going to use a nice soft brush for this one, and we'll just paint this away. Okay, away it goes, disappear, like so. And we'll just tidy that up around the, the bit of the guitar. I don't know what it's called. Um, I'm sure you're all writing in with comments telling me I'm, I'm calling everything wrong thing. This isn't the back of the guitar, it's the front. I don't know, it's a guitar. But hopefully that looks pretty good. I reckon that looks fairly convincing as the back end of a guitar. It's not quite there yet, but it's close. So to really make this look right, we need to add some shading and some light to the, uh, the thing we've just painted in, because it's just a blob of color. So making sure I'm working on the right layer, and you need to watch this, because it's easy to trip you up. If you can see on the layer mask, there is a little kind of square around the outside. That indicates I'm working on the layer mask. If I click on the actual layer, that little sort of highlighted key line goes around the, the actual layer itself to indicate I'm now working on the layer. So with the layer active, I'm going to get myself the, uh, the burn tool. And we'll make sure it's set to highlights. And we're just going to burn in the edges of that guitar, just like that, just to give it some, some 3D depth, just a tiny little hint. And it really was just a few clicks. Last thing we need to do is to match the colors. Remember, I chose a nice pure gray. Well, no disrespect to the photographer here, but your white balance is never going to be absolutely perfect for a pure gray. It just, it, it's so rare that ever, that ever happens. There's always a slight color shift and we need to match that color shift in the image. So I'm going to go up to Image, Adjustments, Hue Saturation, and to tone anything that's gray, you simply click on the Colorize button. You can see it, it takes on a bit of, bit of a tone. Um, I reckon it's probably, and it's normally my case anyway, a slightly yellowish tone. Just pump up the, uh, the lightness a little bit. There you go. And that, if we get it nice and bright, should be a pretty close match for the back of the guitar. Now, admittedly, the owner of the guitar might notice if it isn't absolutely that shape, but for everybody else, I think they'd be quite happy to, to look at that and say, yep, yeah, that's a guitar. The bit I'm going to leave for you to do is that bit of the guitar, because that's just a more complicated shape, but the principles would be exactly the same. Okay, so, boy, would it have been much easier to get it right in camera. But that's not always possible. The real world is that doesn't always happen. So sometimes you have to fake your own guitar. And when you do, that's handy to know you can do that. OK, so we've got time. Well, we've got time for one more because we kind of lost a little bit of that. We'll, we'll just do one little one. We're going to overrun slightly. I'm, I hope that's all right with James. Um, remember, if you've got any questions, do fire them across, and we will get to them at the end. Um, I'm going to finish with this one. now. We don't name photographers. We don't say who sent the image in. Uh, this is an exception to that rule, because this one is actually mine. And I thought it was probably a good idea to put one of my own pictures in at the beginning, beginning just to prove that everybody has things that don't go to plan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the backstory for this, because it's not quite as bad as it looks. I was doing a, a talk at Hearn Bay. This is Hearn Bay Pier. And I was there nice and early to go and do some photography. I thought that would be a good idea. I walked along the promenade and I saw this and thought, yeah, this could make a really nice shot. I like the, the juxtaposition of the old and the new. And I had my nine-stop neutral density filter. But what I didn't have was my tripod. It was in the boot of the car, which was a good 10 minutes walk away. I mean, that, that's a long way, isn't it? So rather than walk back, I thought, yeah, what I'll do is I'll just put my camera bag on the floor and I'll rest my camera on my camera bag, which is what I did. And this is what I got. Perfectly flat-ish, just not very level. 
So to level things off, let's just grab the, the, um, uh, this one tool, tool here, the straighten tool, and I'll just drag a straight line across the horizon, okay, and that'll help to straighten up my horizon. But also, I didn't have a lens that was long enough. Uh, I had a, a 24 to 105. That wasn't nearly long enough. It's nearly a kilometer out to this thing. It's miles. Well, it's not miles. It's a kilometer. But what I am going to do is crop it in. So let's grab the crop tool, and we'll just crop in a little bit. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if I got to finish my, my sentence about uh, the, the bird and, and cropping. Uh, there is a time for cropping, and sometimes there's a time for moving, and um, there's no rights and there's no wrongs on that, was what I was saying. I don't know if you heard it, um, but uh, in this case, I've decided to crop. Okay, so I want to go for that letterboxy shape. I've broken a few of the rules. I've put my horizon slap bang in the middle, and I've put my center of interest slap bang in the middle. The thing is, I know the rules, so I'm allowed to break them. That's how I look at it. Sometimes you've got to break rules. So I'm happy with my, my cropping. I'm happy with my, my alignment. I just need to do a bit of basic processing here. This really is a black and white picture. There's no color in this of note. So let's go the whole hog. Let's take away the saturation. We'll kick up the contrast. And that's my quick and dirty method of making this black and white. There may be one or two sensor dust spots on this image, but I'm going to deal with those in a second. We'll just pop up the exposure a little bit because it's slightly dark. My histogram is a little bit tight as well, so I'm going to bring up my white slider and pull down my black slider and open up the shadows. Okay, so I'm just going to tweak this just so I get something that feels more or less what I was after. And I'm kind of happier with that, but I've gone an entire webinar without touching clarity. Let me rectify that right now. I'm going to take clarity and I'm going to reduce it. Because on these sorts of long exposure shots, this was a 30 second exposure, taking away clarity gives it that nice dreamy feel. But I do want clarity on the actual structure itself. So I'm going to get the adjustment brush, and I'll increase my clarity quite a bit, with a nice small brush, and we'll just paint some clarity on that area, just to give it a little bit of edge and bite. So everything's sort of dreamy soft, and the uh, the landing stage at the end, this is where the steamers used to pull into the Thames Estuary. That's a landing stage. That's nice and crisp and sharp. Okay, one more thing to do, and that is just to sort out the sky, which is a little bit kind of a, a blank gray. I'm just going to get the graduated filter. I'll dial in maybe a stop less exposure, and we'll just drop a nice little gray grad right on the sky, just like that. And that looks really nice. Having added the gray grad, it does feel like the tones are slightly out of kilter. I still think I want a bit more brightness in the image. So let's pop up the brightness. And that's basically my editing done with that shot. All I need to do now is to open the image, click on the open image, and we'll jump into Photoshop where I can finish everything off. Uh, I can, for example, come in here and maybe put a little kind of board around it. I should have a, some actions on it. I build for borders, if I can find them, Doo -doo -doo. Uh, amazing borders, there they are, we'll just put a little, little key line board around it, just so you get an idea, because I think this would make a, a fantastically beautiful print. If you're on the image file, of course, you can use one of the, the partner printers, make a print of this, pop it on your wall, sell it on your gallery, that's the kind of picture that I could see selling really, really well. Uh, so that just leaves me really to do some cloning, so the cloning and spotting, I'm going to use the spot healing tool. It's going to take me a minute or two to do this, so I'm going to throw it back over to James and say, James, are there any questions whilst I'm... I'm I do indeed. Um, you're still there. That's <laughs> <laughs> There's many of us still here. So first of all, sorry for overrunning, guys. It, it's obviously technical problems happen, um, but thanks very much for being with us. And Gavin, don't worry about it. These things happen. It happened to me as I was telling them uh, just before the webinar started. Um, but anyway, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, if I start at the back, then we're actually talking about the image that we're on right now. Okay. Uh, hi, Trevor. Okay, what camera is? I, I know that I know that Gavin is actually cleaning it up right now, which is what Trevor's referring to. Um, he asks what camera it is that that did the picture. Uh, that's a good question. It is most likely a Canon 60D, but I can actually double check I think check it for you. was because I think I saw it written down at the bottom when you were in. There the it is. Uh, yep, Canon 60D. It's the one I take around with me when I'm doing my talks and demonstrations. So there so we are, Trevor. 60D. The one I had with me at the time. 
Um, and the filter I used was a Hoya ND400, which is a nine-stop neutral density filter and increased the exposure time to 30 seconds. Perfect. With the clone stamp, now this is going right the way back now to the owl pictures. The, the, the other questions I have are, are all to do with the owl pictures, uh, apart from guys that say, no, keep going, keep going. We'll do the other ones in two weeks' time. Um, but yeah. on the owl pictures, um, with the clone stamp, what is Gavin's choice of hardness to the brush? Um, it was whatever it was set on, actually. That's a really good question. I don't know. It was um, very, very soft, 0%. Um, generally speaking, with the, um, the clone stamp tool, I don't have the hardness set too high because you will start to see a bit of a, an edge forming like that. Uh, so if you have a hard edge clone stamp tool, it's generally not going to blend in quite so well. There are, there are times when you need to do that, but the majority of the times with the clone stamp tool, uh, it's a good idea to have the hardness turned um, pretty much down to zero. Great. Um, we had another one cropping when we were talking about cropping the owl, maybe instead of instead of uh, moving it, which mm -hmm. would have been a very short webinar. Uh, cropping the owl would be fine, other than the fact that you would lose pixel quality, which I think was actually Gavin's point on the final um, method of moving it, so that you didn't actually have any destruction of the file at all. Yeah, and also, um, I don't know whether you got it, but I was saying if you, if you crop it, then you throw away the number of pixels you have, so your potential for, for larger prints is, is reduced too. I don't know if that Perfect. Got picked up. Uh, no, it didn't, but we're, we're there now. <laughs> but thanks for bringing it up again. <laughs> um, and I had one last one. Could you give more info on the masking part of the owl photo? Uh, the, the masking part of the owl. I photo. think this was the last part, the last. Oh, yes. Part. Okay, so when I was uh, making a copy and uh, see if I can very quickly move this across and then I move that that way and then we mask very, very quickly. So um, with the masking, do they say which bit they want to know or should I just do it again just to. Uh, it just says them? more detail. More, more detail. Sorry. Yes, we, we, can call, we can always go into more detail, but time is the one thing we yeah. don't have. Um, the more detail is really it's a matter if you're going to do masking, you need to be working on the correct layer to mask. So that is, uh, in this case, the top layer. Um, the masking button is down the bottom here. Uh, click on it and it makes a white rectangle. Masking is really simple. With a, a paintbrush, if you paint black, you hide things. If you paint white, you bring them back again. So it's like cutting out with the, um, the eraser tool, but you get the option to go back and undo it. Now, if you want really more information, there are other webinars from the image file that we've done in the past where we've covered masking and so on. So it's a good idea to go back and check on the image file archives and you'll find some information. Absolutely. There. And if you just go into help and support and you write in Hoey or Gavin or GavTrain, they're all, they'll all come up and you'll be able to see a whole range of webinars on Photoshop and Lightroom as well as, um, as Gavin was saying earlier, the Smart Object webinar, which actually I found fascinating. I didn't realize that you could do that sort of thing with Photoshop. I know Gavin thinks it's very ho-hum, you know, these, these techniques, because he's doing them all the time. But if you don't do those things, it's amazing how much time they can actually save you. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for being with us. Gavin, thank you very much. Two weeks' time, so remember, if you've got images that you want to send in, uh, just go to fix a photo on the image file and you'll be able to you'll be able to see how to submit them send them in we can forward them on to Gavin for next webinar two weeks time Gavin thank you very much for your your expertise once again and we'll speak to you very soon lovely thank you very much for listening everybody and I'll see you again in two weeks time